What's the deal with the Gibson Collector's Choice series? Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. The Gibson Collector's Choice series was first birthed in the year 2010 and lasted until about 2017. They did 40 different guitars. Despite numbers going higher than that, they didn't necessarily number them in any particular order. Most of them, they made a maximum of 300. Some of them were a little bit less, but these were seen as the cream of the crop of Gibson, where they would take these famous guitars and scan them to completely replicate their top carve, neck profile, pickup output, and they mainly did it on bursts. So if you want to collect 30 plus 58 through 60 burst reissues, this is the series for you. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't the Lone Firebird 335, Double Cut Junior, and even something that you could construe as an R6. However, some of these guitars later got reissued in slightly more accurate ways. Collector's Choice number one was actually greeny. Collector's Choice 1A was a slightly different version of it. But now we've got the USA, we've got the Custom Shop, and then we've got the Collector's Edition. But today we are going to document Collector's Choice number 28. It is a 1958 reissue. My friends, this is the Ronnie Montrose Burst. So these were kind of like precursors to the True Historics. I mean, True Historics technically rank above these, depending on which model you're looking at. But this is an absolutely gorgeous guitar. Look at that flame top. This is actually my first collector's choice that I've documented. So I'm excited to experience this and see how did they actually do these things. At first impressions, this is a good weight. The aging so far actually looks pretty good for not being Murphy doing them. It's just the in-house aging at the time, which I've had both good and bad experiences with in the past. They've got this really nice aged cherry with some relic spots trying to match the original. The entire neck on this example has been completely worn down, but it doesn't feel like the modern Murphy aged ones. I mean, it almost feels like they sprayed another light lacquer over top of the wear rather than just a raw mahogany feel. So it's kind Kind of like the difference between a full-on gloss versus a semi-gloss almost satin. A fun fact, the stock photography for this model doesn't actually have the aged neck, so that's something they added after creating the marketing materials for these, but I'm glad they aged it because that's how the original one is. Now I'm kind of embarrassed to say that when I bought this guitar, I thought this was, oh, Stone Temple Pilots, it's that guy that used it and okay, collector's choice. No, that's not what this is at all. So this is Ronnie Montrose's old guitar, and if you're not familiar with him, he played with the band Montrose, also with Gamma and Rail, but if you know the songs Rock Candy or Bad Motor Scooter, you're familiar with the sound of this guitar. So Ronnie used this burst in his career, but then he later sold it to Peter Waya, who is a very, very famous session musician from Germany, and he's used it on hundreds of thousands of recordings. You've probably heard it on the radio many a times without maybe even knowing it. The original was actually for sale by Guitar Point over in Germany. They wanted 375,000 euros for it when it was up. So you can see these photos of it. You can see the wear on the back. You can see it on the headstock. As well as the front of the guitar. So as far as the aging job goes, sure it's not perfect, but I would say they did a relatively good job after comparing it to these original photos. And it's a relatively mild flame top. This burst is incredibly well known for its tone, not necessarily its looks. I'd make the argument that this reissue has too nice of a top to be the STP burst, but they got a similar color, not exactly the same, and is missing one very key important detail. The reason why this guitar is called the STP burst is there used to be a small STP sticker right here, you know, the oil slash racing company. So if you look on the original over here, there's a very small, slightly less faded section where the sticker was. And unfortunately, these reissues don't have that, which is like the defining features. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's why some of these got re-reissued. I think one of the coolest collector's choices is the Tom Scholes. It's his Mighty Mouse guitar, but without the really cool Mighty Mouse sticker on it. Come on. But these were $6,332 brand new at MSRP. They made a maximum of 300 of them. They were produced starting in 2014, and they were each numbered. Now I say a maximum of 300 because there's always that disclaimer on the page. If we run out of wood, we'll cut the run short or something. But what they were really saying was, if there's not a lot of demand for these, we're not going to make as many. Case in point, the 335 of the run, they didn't have much confidence in, so they only made 25 of them. But that was a published number. 
Some of these collector's choices didn't sell that well. I'm not sure if this was one of them, but it was not uncommon for some of them to get sent back to the factory and reworked into something else. But all things considered, 6,332 bucks. If these things were to come out today at that price point, I think they would sell instantaneously. This is a 58 reissue. A brand new one of those today is $5,300. That's non-age. You could step up to the light aged at $5,799. However, I think this is more so akin to a heavy aged one that's $7,799. So that's the real reason why some of these collector's choices have been going up in value. It's because you can get an artist, at least influenced guitar that was a limited edition versus getting just a brand new generic R8 that has whatever top that they give you. I mean, this is actually a very nice top for an R8. So if you look at old listings where you could get these for like 4,000 bucks, yeah, the story is a lot different today on on most of the collector's choices. But besides just the guitar, you also got a Lifton case. It's not one of the aged ones, it's just your standard Lifton of the era. You got a custom shop hang tag, Gibson custom hang tag, and then there's a leather bound COA. Unfortunately, this example does not have that because it was bought at Guitar Center. They lost the COA when the original owner purchased this. That's a very common plight on Guitar Center guitars. So it's possible this isn't even the original case. And there were also some Ronnie Montrose picks that I don't have. But this is probably the most important. You have a really cool Ronnie Montrose USB drive that's actually made out of wood. It also has Gibson Custom engraved on the back. It's on this cool lanyard. Now, as far as the contents on what's on this USB, it's basically a promotional video that I did not see posted anywhere else. So I will do a separate upload because it has copyrighted music on it. But it's a recount of Michael Indelicato's remembrance of him purchasing the guitar from Leo's music and some of the stories behind the instrument, as well as a small talk from his wife, Lisa Montrose. But the story of how I got this one is I was working a deal on a very, very nice Norland era Les Paul, but we were just a little bit too far away to come to terms. So he thought, well, maybe if we throw this other guitar into the deal, we can get closer on our numbers. So thankfully that worked out. We will see that other guitar get documented a little bit later on. But for today, let's finish out the review of the STP Burst by throwing it onto the workbench to take an individual look at its parts and specs. Inside the Montrose Burst, let's take a look at these pickups first, starting with our covers. You can see they're actually very tastefully aged. The whole aging process on this guitar is actually really nice, and generally, I'm more of a critic towards aged guitars. So these were marketed as custom buckers that were specifically wound to have the exact same resistance and readings as his original set that was in the guitar. Problem with that is as the pickup ages, sometimes the windings get a little bit less extreme and the readings will change. So as of 2014, this is supposed to be a good representation. And it's kind of funny, the story behind this guitar is... The original owner went into Guitar Center one day. You know, everybody has a tale like this. He wasn't really looking to buy a guitar, but he picked this thing up and he fell in love with the way it sounded. And he was a big Montrose fan. So that's why it ended up coming home with him. But speaking of our readings, 7.26 in the bridge, 7.72 in the neck, and the middle just for fun at 3.74. It's really not that uncommon to have a hotter neck pickup than it is your bridge. But inside of our cavities here, I would expect nothing less than this long neck tenon. We can also see the maple capping off the truss rod route. And in our bridge pickup cavity, the maple top joining onto the mahogany body. And this has one of those retro ground wires that goes through the cavity right here, instead of being hidden within the guitar right there. You have a non-wire ABR1 bridge with branding as such. On a collector's choice, I would hope it would be installed historically, and it is. And we've got the lightweight tailpiece. Nickel plated, as everything else is. So apparently the story goes is at one point in time, a Bigsby was put on here, but we don't have any Bigsby holes. And I didn't necessarily see them on the original photos, so that must have been an arch top style one that didn't need drilling into the top like the typical B7 that you put on a Les Paul. And it's possible they just secured it using the bottom strap button, or maybe the original has some screw holes down here that we missed. So that's the story behind the impressions that they put on the top here. Our poker chip has all the writing worn off of it, and we have an amber switch tip from the factory. I just really wish they would have had the slight sticker shadow right there. I mean, if they have the shadow on the edges, it wouldn't have been that much harder to do it in one more location. However, looking at the original again, it is a very subtle difference. It's not necessarily red like red eye. It's just a little bit less faded than the rest. So who knows, maybe we will see another 
collector's edition of this guitar in the future because it is pretty iconic but apparently he had at least three bursts but this is the one that was used on the famous Montrose album but it's got finish checking everywhere but it's not like overly apparent if you run your nail over it that you feel it it feels very similar to vintage checking now as far as nitty-gritty details yeah maybe they didn't get everything right like I would have liked to have seen those splotches that were down here but we do have a little bit of the non-faded finish down here and right over here by the pick guard that the original had. Something else that's kind of cool of how they did this finish is if you look at the edge, you can see there's a little bit of red in certain areas where it's been bled out and others. We've got some pretty nasty internal cracking to our plastic knobs here. That could have happened in shipping or it might be part of the aging process. I'm not entirely too sure. That's the problem with a 10 year old aged guitar, you don't really know. But at the same time, if you're worried about condition, buy an aged guitar because no one will know the difference. As long as it's not something obvious, like there's a big gouge in the top. But here's underneath our pick guard area that you don't normally see. A couple of additional dings probably matching his guitar. But here's a look at our pick guard. It's looking pretty good. But moving on from our mahogany body, two-piece maple top, we've got our mahogany neck with a rosewood fretboard. Got your true celluloid inlays, super pointy. And you've got your tortoiseshell side marker inlays with your binding that is also worn. You can see how there's a little bit of yellow in that corner and it's much more yellow up here. That's because the lacquer has been played off, meaning they aged it. But what I like is sometimes on aged guitars, it's like an abrupt difference. This one feels very minor. I hate to talk down about the Murphy Lab today, but I like the way this was done a little bit better, personally. As far as getting the feel of a slightly worn-in guitar. And oh my goodness, a collector's choice that was actually played by somebody. We do have a little bit of fret wear in the first couple of areas, but that works great for an aged guitar. I always find that funny. They never touch the frets or the fretboard. Do I think they'll do it in the future? I think they might. And that's going to further divide the community because usually you just want the aged look of a guitar, but you still want the nice playability. But this is fully level recrownable. I wouldn't even waste your time yet until it gets more wear. But we have a 24 3 quarter inch scale length paired with a 12 inch fretboard radius with supposedly duped specs of 1.71 inches at the nut width, which increases to 2.08 by the 12th. A glorious first fret neck depth of 0.894 which chunks to 1.05 by the 12th. But some of that you're catching the heel, so 1.01 by the 10th. Here it is on the contour gauge, first fret and 12th fret. It's a chunky neck, but as far as R8s go, it's not the biggest neck I've ever seen. And every example is going to vary slightly. Here's what our truss rod cover looks like. It's your standard historic beveled edge version, white on the back. And our truss rod is in good shape over here. The nut is made of nylon. As far as the rest of our headstock, we've got some sort of a ding up here. I would assume that's factory, but again, I don't know. But the Les Ball model silkscreen has been slightly faded away. It's got the Hollywood veneer exposed on the edge. So that's cool to see it up over on the top instead of just seeing it on the side like you normally do. And we've got our clues and tuners. And the fun continues on back here. I was really impressed to see this. That was never advertised. That's the original serial number of the Montrose burst stamped on the inside, 86787. But as far as the wiring, it just looks like typical historic spec bumblebee capacitors. So all is looking good here. You've got the R8 stamped on your shelf over there and you got the extra deep cherry rim. Look at that, they were nice enough to scratch up your back plate for you too. And they put one of these fancy 2014 medallions on it. I would assume originally you had a spare black one in the case. We can see the other side of the guitar now. You've got all the cherry as far as the back goes, but then for whatever reason the sides faded on that original one. And check out the flame maple cap. That's why thin binding in the cutaway is cool when you have extreme figuring right there because you get that checkered effect. But speaking of checkering, you can see all your finished checking running across this. Got some buckle wear areas and the entire edge has been worn through. But just like the neck, this feels like it's been treated with something. It's possible that they just oiled it. Because that's the thing about vintage guitars that do get worn through to the bare wood. Usually it's just not the bare wood that you'll feel because the player keeps playing it and then their sweat and oils absorb into the wood and kind of creates a different feeling. But I'm definitely glad they decided to age the neck on these unlike the stock photos. I think they saved themselves by doing that because when the public has access to actual photos of the guitar and you miss a major milestone point like that, yeah, people are gonna get upset. But here's our clues and tuners, single line, single ring, and then our serial number, CC for collector's choice, number 28, A run, and then the number out of 300. This one is 161.
And we've got the wear to the top. Just for fun, let's do a black light test. Everything glows the way I would expect. However, we do have a little bit of a sweat absorption in that area. So does the back. Okay, that's normal sweat absorption area, but that one, if you come over here to the neck, this glows significantly different too. No, you know what that is. That's the overspray that I was talking about that I could totally feel. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what that is. Makes perfect sense for all the areas that have exposed wood. I'm really glad I ended up blacklighting this. As far as the weight, a little bit under eight and a half pounds at eight pounds, six ounces. Not too bad for a solid body electric guitar. Let's go ahead, plug it in and hear how it sounds. So clean tones, definitely close to the Montrose album. It's clean, but yet it's still biting and attacking. Now, of course, you can also roll your volumes down and pick a little bit lighter. And the neck pickup is ridiculously dark. Nice try me middle, so let's go ahead and kick on some dirt. <laughs> Thank you. 
such a great dark woody tone to it. Love it. You're trying to do classic rock. It's just great. <laughs> Now that we know all about the Montrose collector's choice, what are my final thoughts on this thing? Holy cow. The guy I bought it from said it was good and I 1000% agree with him. They did something special with this. Now it's my first collector's choice, so I don't know if they're all this good or if this just happens to be a particularly fine example, but this has completely changed my thoughts and opinions of the collector's choice series in general. I do want to document them all now. Whereas before it was just kind of a, eh, okay, they're semi what reissues. They don't get every single detail right. But now it's like, okay, maybe they were onto something with how they aged these guitars back in this era. I'm not slamming the modern day Murphy lab. I mean, it's probably a lot of the same people doing it. They're just being instructed to do it a different way. But this piece of wood is quite fantastic. And while I would love to have a complete collection of collector's choices. I can't afford that. So unfortunately, it will be catch and release on this one. But yes, somebody buy this and play it. It deserves to be played. It sounds fantastic. Outside of the uniqueness of the pickups, it truly is all about how this neck feels. That's where the true magic of this guitar lies. It really does feel like an old worn in glove, a nice guitar that's been used quite a bit. All right, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.